when I was growing up as a kid, I attributed success to money and wealth. That is what I thought in life that defined you as a human. I thought the more money you had in your bank, the bigger your house was, the more watches you had, the bigger the car you had, was your was, did that defined you by the level of success and what value you was as a person. I was as bad as what you could get. Like literally, I was in the end, I was at the end of the road. You could not go anywhere else from where I was. I was sitting in a in a double category A high security unit in in a prison, told that I would never change. It was impossible. It was built in the 1990s for the IRA. Um, and I go into this unit. There was eight prisoners. Um, Sheikh Abu Hamza, who was fighting the tradition in the United States of America, and the 21-7 su uh, attempted suicide bombers that tried to blow up the tubes. Um, and that that was then my you life. You were in there with them? Yes. You saw them? Yep. I was with them every day for two, two and a half years. Um, there was literally, that was my life. Right. I knew I was in trouble, but then when you go on there and you realize the lengths to which the police want to keep you in there and not let you out, I realized that I was probably not going to get out of this situation. So if I've managed to do this, anyone can, anyone can. And I just want to be able to get that message out. As, as I think the judge or one of the officers said to you before, people like you don't change. So what caused people like you to actually change? When... My best mate died, or best friend from it being from 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 childhood, basically, um, died in a car crash, committing a robbery in the Netherlands. I had never experienced emotion like it in my life, and and I remember sitting in this cell, and and I realised how one our precious life is, and and my friend's life had just literally gone out like a light, and he never had children, he never got married, um, and I realised how pathetic. It was the situation. Like I thought I was winning some sort of war in my head against the system and the state. And, and, and actually, I was just basically pissing my life away. It was like someone switched on a tap and my life was literally going down into a drain um, every day, every breath I was taking. I was literally spending my life on earth locked in this tiny little box thinking that I was winning some sort of war in my head against the system and being defiant. And I remember watching the news and they showed CCTV clips of the final moments of of my mate's life. And he was in some shitty supermarket in the Netherlands, spraying uh, a can of CS spray into the lens of the camera. And it froze, the camera froze. And there was a picture still. And I could see it was him because I could tell by his eyes. And I just remember like looking at that TV screen and I was like, I don't know, it just, it just hit me like I looked how pathetic it was. Like the situation that, that that I was in, and 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 it made me look at my own mortality, and, and it made me look at my mate. That I saw what I I saw the, where I was at. It was pathetic in that context, but how that could have been me, and I could have been them, that person. Like how lucky and fortunate I was, because I could have been shot dead back in two thousand and four when the police tried to arrest me, and my life would have ceased to exist that day in that car park in South East London. And I saw the fact that I was alive as a blessing. Um, and, I, and, and I made a decision that night that I was done. I was done with that life. You sit there and you've still got X amount of years left to serve of that sentence. So it was <laughs> to say I was in that moment lost is an understatement because I genuinely didn't know what I wanted to do with my life other than I didn't want to be where I was at and I wanted to do something different with my life. Um, and then I probably meet the most remarkable human that I've ever have ever had the privilege to ever meet in my life. And, and that was the prison officer that, <laughs> that, that aided me um, to, to, to find that belonging and find that sense of worth and direct and change your direction into something and, and put that energy and drive that I still had as a human in something productive and positive. Well, I was once that scumbag that was sitting in a maximum security unit with suicide bombers. Since my since I decided to turn, change my the course of my life round, I end up setting three world records. In prison. In prison and eight British records <laughs> on indoor rare machine or uh, uh, multiple different distances. I always remember what he said to me about having a gift and not wasting it and doing something with it. Before it was about money when I was a kid, then... I realized I was good at sport. It was about medals. It was about Ironman. And I believed, even when I changed, that I still wanted to achieve something in my life. 
And I thought legacy then was by being really good at sport and winning medals and having all those records and having all those placards on my wall and doors. And that would define me as a person by my legacy. And I was consumed by it. Overtrained, got ill, um, fixed that, got better at sport. But then what really changed my life was when I got opportunities to go into schools. And at the beginning, I was like, I don't really see what value I'm going to have. Because again, you don't really understand. I don't, yeah. I don't feel what I've done is exceptional. And I don't, I'm me. Like I'm John. I've gone through the journey that I've gone through, the experience I've gone through. And I'd never realized the impact that could have on other people's lives. Um, and then I got off from the opportunities to um, a school talk. And at the end, this young boy, his name was called George, followed me and the head teacher out. And me and the head teacher went to his office to have a debrief. And George followed us out. And he said, sir, can I speak to John? And so George looked at me, then he was 14 years old. And he went to me, I'm like you. And I said, what do you mean you're like me? And he went, I'm like you. And I said, I, I genuinely didn't understand what he meant. And he said, my dad's coming out of prison. I, my mum's brought me up with my sister. I don't want to go to prison. And he started crying. And honestly, I've, I've, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. I genuinely haven't. I never, I, it, was, it was such a powerful moment to know I had impacted on that young boy's life where now whatever I said to him, he was highly susceptible to listen to what I was about to yeah. say because he could relate to me. And I said to him in life, you've got an awareness that I didn't have at your age. You realize all the triggers and all the warning signals now, but you don't want that life, which is good because I didn't see that at your age. What do you want to do with your life? And he said, I want to work in sport. I'm not good at sport though. And I said, you don't need to be good at sport. You could be a messer. You could be a physio. You could, there's so many other occupations within the sports world that you can do. You're in a school. It's geared up for sport. They want to encourage you and help you and stuff. So, and I stayed in contact with George via, and I used to phone up the school um, and, and Simon Cox said teacher used to put George on the phone in the office and we used to, I used to chat oh. to him in the car on the way to the gym, um, every now and again, just to keep him in, in, in and, and the most, and honestly, man, like it was like Simon Cox phoned me up when he did his GCSEs and, um, he was walking around the, uh, the hall and I'm not there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not there. Like, I don't know this. And George puts his pen down in the GCSE hall and sits back. And Simon goes over to him and says, what's wrong, George? And he says, I can't do it, sir. He went, I can't do it. He said, why can't you do it? He went, I can't. He went, I can't, I can't do it. And he said to him, George, what would John tell you to do now? And Simon said, I walked away and I looked back and he picked up his pen and started writing again. And when he told me that story, mate, honestly, man, it got like, <laughs> even yeah. now it was so powerful. It was yeah. so, so powerful. And then he sat his GCSEs and he ended up getting a C in that, in that oh. grade. Um, and then he, he signed on to college, but to have that impact over a young person's life where they listen to what you're saying, um, I realized then that that was my calling in life. And, and then I realized that I had this awareness again in my life, which you, you constantly have and you're developing, growing that legacy is actually, it isn't about money and it isn't about winning stuff. It's about you having a positive impact on other people's lives and lifting other people up and by me impacting on George's life. If George now doesn't go to prison and he has children and those children don't go to prison and their lives are good because George's life's good and their kids' lives are better, all because he interacted with me, that's what legacy is about. It's about reaching back and lifting people up. I was genuinely surprised, but the further along the journey I've gone since I've been released from prison, the social difference in this country is and how so few have so much and, and so many have so little um, to the degree where like children, the, like a headmaster once phoned me up when it was snowing. Like I remember when I was at school, snow day, I was loving it. <laughs> didn't have school. I didn't have school. Like you'd be off school for three or four days. I was loving it. And headmaster phoned me up in Essex and I, I developed a really close relationship with him. And he said, I've, I've, we've had to close the school. And, and I've said, I bet the kids love it. And he said, he said, John, he said, I feel so bad because I know today for the next two or three days probably, that probably about 70% of my school will not eat a meal for breakfast or lunch because they're solely reliant on the school providing those meals because the kids aren't eating when they're home because they haven't, they haven't, the mums and dads haven't got the money or they haven't got the food to eat. This sort of inequality is, is staggering and it's not something we I typically talk a lot about on this podcast, but I think it's an important topic. And as I try and talk to more and more varied people about different things about... You know, it's all ultimately how to live better, how we can all live better lives. And 
I think we live better lives, not only when we feel better individually, but when society is happier yes. and healthier around us. Yep. It's very hard to be happy when, yes, you're individually doing well, but people around you are struggling. Yes. I think that it's... But we are all on the same rock. Yeah. We're all on this earth at the same moment in time in history. Like we're all here together and yeah. we're all going to end up in the same six foot hole at the end of it. So again, my belief is the fact we should work together and we should help other people. Yeah. And, that, and that's what life should be about. It shouldn't be about profit constantly, like yeah. selling you stuff constantly. It should be about working together and helping you, yeah. helping your fellow man. Because like you said, society, community becomes so much better by living that yeah. sort of existence. And when, and when we don't live it, you, you see all the disharmony that, that's going on in the world today and yeah. all the hatred. And Exactly. It's getting to that point now where we can't keep doing things the way we've always done them. So it's getting more and more toxic. And it is about that. It is about that compassion. I think that's what is really missing in society. I believe that what I'm doing today was my calling. And yeah. I believe that was what I was put on earth to do. And that's why, like, again, someone once said to me, like, do you ever get nervous if you stand up in front of 2,000 people and speak? And I don't. Because even if I tried to mess up what I was about to say, it would be impossible. Because I can't. Because I'm speaking from my heart. Yeah. I don't have to memorize stuff. I don't have to go up with notes. Because what I'm saying, I believe in, and it's, my, it's me being true to myself. You are here for a reason. You there's there's no doubt that your story is so powerful that it is making an impact. It is going to change people's lives. No matter where you're at, you can make change. You can turn your life around. Have you got some closing thoughts for people that no matter where they're at in their life, they can think about applying to improve the way things are? I think everyone um, is inherently gifted at something. Um, I'm a great believer in positive thought, visualization. Um, and working towards something. And, and, and it's not about being the best, it's about being the best version of you. Um, I might not be the greatest Ironman athlete in the world, but I just want to be the best I can be. Um, and that's what's important in life, like you being the best version of you and, and, and believing that there's a possibility you can always get better, you can always overcome, and it's never the end until it's the end. So until you take your last dying breath and they're going to put you in that casket, You've, you've got life, and if you've got life, live it. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough, you need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.